Ever wondered how online booking platforms like Airbnb and Booking.com manage to prevent double booking across thousands of accommodations and hotels worldwide? In this video, we'll uncover the key challenges in designing a hotel booking system and provide you with the strategies to solve them, giving you the edge in your next system design interview. So let's jump straight in. So looking at the functional requirements first, the first one would be hotel management. So hotel managers should be able to add and remove hotels, as well as add and remove rooms of a given room type. They should also be able to update the pricing and inventory of room types to reflect changes in availability or rates. There should also be search and reservation for users, so they should be able to search for hotels and rooms using various filters such as location, number of beds, price range and check-in check-out dates. And the system should also display available hotels and room types that match their search criteria. And then obviously users should be able to create and cancel reservations as needed. Users should also have access to view their past reservations, so their reservation history, allowing them to review previous reservations and the details associated. And then finally, there should also be notifications. So users should receive notifications for important events such as successful creation of a reservation or cancellation confirmation. And then for the non-functional requirements, the first one is consistency. So the system must handle concurrent requests efficiently to ensure that no two customers can book the same room on a particular day, maintaining high data consistency. And there should also be low latency. So the platform should provide quick responses to user actions, ensuring a smooth and responsive user experience. So this is a basic outline of some of the core tables that could be included in a hotel reservation system data model. Obviously in a production system, it would have a lot more tables with a lot more information within each table, but this is just a core outline that be, could be used within a interview setting. So the first table could be the users table. So this would store information about all users. So this could include hotel managers and customers. There would also be a hotels table, which contain information about hotels, again, managed by hotel managers. There would also be room types. So this would define different types of rooms available in each hotel, as well as the rooms table, which would represent individual rooms under each room type. We'd also have room pricing. So this would manage dynamic pricing for room types on specific dates, and it would have a composite primary key. So you could use a combination of room type ID as well as date to uniquely identify each pricing entry. And then similarly, there would also be the room inventory table, which would track the number of available rooms for each room type on specific dates. And again, this would also have a primary composite key combined of room type ID and date, again, to uniquely identify each inventory entry. There'd also be a re reservations table to store reservation details made by users, a notifications table, and then uh, amenity related tables. So this could store possible amenities associated with hotel or room types. Next, looking at the API design. So for a hotel reservation system, you could use a classic RESTful API to interact with the data. RESTful APIs are simple, they're widely used, they're stateless, and they support caching, which makes it a good candidate for our system. And our REST API will comprise of four main endpoints. Obviously, in a production system, there'll be a lot more, but again, given time constraints to an interview, focusing on the core ones is what is recommended. So the first one is a post request to the API hotels endpoint. So this allows a hotel manager to add a new hotel to the platform and the parameters could include the name and the description, etc. of the hotel. Second endpoint will be a post endpoint to the API hotel ID uh, room types. And so this will allow a hotel manager to add a new room type to a specific hotel. And again, you could include the hotel ID, the name, the description, uh, of the room, etc., in the parameters. Third would be a get request to the API search. And so this will allow users to search for hotels and room types based on various filters and view the available options. And there's a large number of parameters that can be included here, including location, check-in, check-out dates, number of guests, number of beds, etc. And then the final endpoint will be a post request to the API reservations endpoint. And this will allow a user to create a new reservation for a specific room type. And again, the parameters could include the hotel ID, the room type ID, and the check-in and check-out dates. So to really understand the overall architecture, I'm going to walk through two of the main flows. And then at the end, once you've gone through and understood the flows, you should be able to understand the entire architecture as one single unit. And so in my opinion, this is the best way of understanding uh, this system design. So the first flow we're gonna look at is adding a hotel flow. And so to start off the hotel manager, so an admin user will send a post request to the admin service API endpoint with the hotel and room details. And that can also include the images and amenities associated with that hotel. There'll be client side validation to ensure that all the required fields are filled in. And the request will also include an authentication token, like a JSON web token to verify the 
the user's identity and permissions. So the request will reach the API gateway, which will then analyze the request and route it to the appropriate microservice. And in this case, it will be to the admin service. The API gateway can also perform authentication, authorization, and implement rate limiting. And it could also handle maybe load balancing by distributing incoming connections and requests to maintain optimal performance. So the admin service will ensure that all the mandatory fields are present and correctly formatted. And it can then extract the images from the request and upload them to an object storage service like AWS S3 or Azure Blob Storage. And then it could retrieve the URLs or keys for the uploaded images. And then these uploaded images are then distributed via content delivery network, so a CDN. And so then a CDN edge service can then cache the images to reduce latency per end users. And this offloads traffic from the origin server and enhances image load times globally. The admin service will then create a message containing the hotel data, room type details, amenities, and image URLs. And then that's pushed onto a messaging system like Kafka. And so what this will do is it will decouple the request response cycle from heavy processing tasks and promote scalability. And so messages can be partitioned by hotel ID for further scalability and ordered processing. And so we can then return a response to the client indicating that the hotel addition request has been received and is being processed. The admin consumer is a background worker service which is horizontally scaled and listens to the Kafka topic and pull, pulls messages from that admin queue. It will then begin a transaction in a relational database, so Postgres, MySQL, and in, will then insert that data into the appropriate tables, so hotels, room types, amenities, etc. And so using a relational database will provide us with strong ACID guarantees so atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability, which are crucial for transactional operations like hotel additions. And if it's successful, the transaction will then be committed. We will then also update the elastic search cluster. So the new hotel and room type will then be indexed for search functionality. And given that elastic search does not support asset transactions in the same way as relational databases, we could implement a two phase commit. And so while a two phase commit could theoretically synchronize the database and elastic search, it's pretty impractical due to the complexity and performance overhead. And so here we could be willing to accept eventual consistency as search functionality is not as critical as a booking a room. And so therefore, if indexing fails, a message can be placed on a message queue for further review and retries. And the use of item potency keys would be useful to prevent duplicate processing of the same data. And so if an error were to occur, we could roll back the database transaction and log the error for uh, further debugging and maybe implement retry logic with exponential back off and move the message onto a dead letter queue if retrials fail uh, altogether. So once the hotel is successfully added, the admin consumer can then add a message onto the notification queue. The notification service can then pull messages off the notification queue and notify users via the relevant third party providers, e.g. Mailjet for email, Apple push notification service for iOS and Firebase Cloud Messenger for Android. The next flow we're going to look at is creating a reservation flow. So the user will send a get request with the search filters to find available hotels and rooms. And so the filter parameters can include location, check-in, check-out dates, number of guests, number of beds, etc. And again, the request will also include authentication token to verify the user's identity and permissions. So the API gateway, again, will route this to the correct service, in this case, the hotel service. The hotel service will first query the Elasticsearch cluster to do initial filter of the available hotels and room types based on the provided filters. So a full text search can be performed on hotel names and descriptions. We could do geospatial queries for location-based information and filtering based on amenities, price range, etc. And so this will then return a list of hotels and room types that match the user's filters, excluding real-time availability and dynamic pricing information. And so to get that information, a relational database query will be made using the list of room type IDs returned from Elasticsearch and a batch query is performed on the hotel database, which is sharded by hotel ID. And we're gonna check if the available rooms is greater than zero for each date in the user's requested date range in the room inventory table. And so this will ensure that the room type is available for the entire stay. And so for dynamic pricing, a sum can be performed on the price from the room pricing table for the requested dates to calculate the total price. You could also have a caching layer here. So use a distributed cache like Redis cluster for frequently accessed availability and pricing data to reduce database load. So that response is then compiled and then sent back to the user and included in the response are the hotel and room details, real time availability status, accurate pricing details and image URLs served via the content delivery network. Next, the user will then select a hotel and room type from the search results and initiate a reservation process. So the user will send a post request to the reservation service to create a reservation with the relevant parameters, including an item potency key 
for, for instance, a UUID, which is a unique key to handle retries and prevent duplicate bookings. So the reservation service must handle reservations in a distributed environment, ensuring data consistency and to prevent double bookings. So hotels have been sharded by hotel ID. And so all data related to a specific hotel is stored on the same shard, which enables the use of local transactions on a single shard, removing the need for distributed transactions. So the reservation service first checks if the provided item potency key has already been processed by querying a distributed data store, for example, Redis, where processed item potency keys are stored with a TTL, time to live. If the key exists, the server retrieves and returns the result of the previous operation, avoiding duplicate processing. Otherwise, the server proceeds with processing the reservation and stores the item potency key. Next, the reservation service will then begin a transaction with a serializable isolation level, which will ensure that transactions are executed as if they were sequential, preventing dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads. And so while it can reduce concurrency and system throughput, given the need to prevent double bookings, this trade-off is acceptable. And then using row level locking, the database will automatically acquire locks on rows that are read or modified during a transaction. And so for reservation systems, pessimistic locking is preferred to prevent overselling rooms. And both the serialization isolation level example, as well as pessimistic locking are also described in detail in the write-up if you want to check that out over at techprep.app. Next in the room inventory table for each date, from the check-in date to the day before the checkout date, we want to ensure that the available rooms is greater than or equal to the number of rooms for e each date. So a database constraint will prevent available rooms from going below zero. So after the update, the locks are released by the database's transaction system. If all operations succeed, we want to commit the local transaction. Otherwise, we can roll it back the transaction and return an error to the user. Upon successful reservation creation, the reservation service publishes a message to a notification queue, which will then be picked up by the notification service and sent to the relevant third party notification provider. So here's a view of the complete architecture. And so if you go through both flows again, it encompasses the entire architecture. But as always, I like having that single snapshot so that when you go in into an interview, you have this mental snapshot that you can retrieve from memory and hopefully just simply walk through and describe each each component in detail like we've just done such that the interview will go as smoothly as possible. And so in terms of additional discussion points, you could discuss payment processing. So maybe integrating with third party payment services. So utilize payment gateways like Stripe or PayPal for secure and reliable transaction processing. And then you could also use webhooks to handle asynchronous payment events and update reservation statuses accordingly. And then also you could dive deep into error handling. So you want robust error handling and retry. So you could implement comprehensive error handling with retries and exponential backoff for transient failures. You could use try catch blocks to manage exceptions gracefully and provide meaningful feedback to users. And you could also employ circuit breakers to prevent cascading failures in dependent services and to isolate false. And then finally for monitoring and logging. So if we're looking at monitoring first, you could use tools like Prometheus and Grafana for real time metrics and implement health checks and application monitoring tools to monitor service performance. And then for logging, you could use aggregate logs with the ELK stack or gray log and then employ structured logging, for example, JSON and set up alerts for critical events. So hopefully you got some use out of this system design. If you did, if you could like and subscribe and share it with a friend, it helps the channel out a lot. And if you are preparing for any technical interviews, make sure to check out techprep.app. It's got the most up-to-date technical interview questions and solutions. And hopefully I will see you in the next one.